So we are in Kingdom Animalia, and we will start our look at the clade Bilatera with the group Lophotrochozoans. So here are some general tips for working with the narrative PowerPoints. If you need more specific help, please see the file in Dropbox called Help with Narrated PowerPoints. And if that still doesn't work, feel free to email Professor Dempsey or Professor Turley and we will work with you to fix whatever issues you're experiencing. So these PowerPoints are a joint product that Professor Dempsey and myself, Professor Turley, have been putting together over the course of several years. We've worked together in an effort to bring you, the student, the best possible learning experience. We are both firm believers in the hypothesis that two heads are better than one and that working together makes for a more well-rounded curriculum for you guys. So whether you have Professor Dempsey narrating a lecture or lab PowerPoint or myself narrating them, it really doesn't matter because we both stand behind this product. Just as a heads up, we both work at more than one campus, so on occasion you may hear references to other campuses that you are not located at. Not to worry, um, you may hear references to Northlake College or Collin College or even Grayson College because we pull resources from all of the campuses we work at in order to provide you guys with the best possible experience. So. Don't worry if you hear a reference to a campus that you're not located at. It's not a big deal. Um, another thing, textbooks updates will always trump the PowerPoints. So if you have the most current edition of the textbook and it disagrees with the PowerPoint, the textbook is what we will default to for lecture. Um, if you come across anything like this, shoot Professor Dempsey or myself an email and we will look into it. Instructor announcements of any updates will also always trump the PowerPoints. So if you're in an in-person class, please attend class. It's very important so that you can get the announcements. If you are an online class, please pay attention to Blackboard announcements and to emails because we will contact you with any new information. If you spot an error in the material, feel free to shoot us an email and let us know. We are all about fixing mistakes. Now, granted, if it's a there's a comma missing in this sentence, we probably aren't going to jump on that quite as fast as if it's a content error. But regardless, we do like to fix errors, so just let us know and we'll get to work on them. So here are the objectives for this presentation please read through them. At the end of the presentation, if you cannot complete these objectives, please go back through the presentation and re-watch the areas that you're struggling with. So now that we have finished clade radiata, which are organisms that no matter which way you cross-section them, you get an equal right and left half. These are column-shaped organisms. And we're going to move on to the clade bilatera. In clade bilatera, you can only slice the organism one way to get an equal right and left half. There are three main groups in this clade. We will start with the Lophotrochozoans, the most basal group, and then move on to the Ectozoans, and finally we'll finish off with the group Deuterostomia, the most evolutionary advanced of the three. So the question is, what is a Lophotrochozoan, and how do you distinguish them from the rest of Animalia? Well, this won't really tell us much because it's a very large and diverse group. The organisms are bilateral. They are triploblastic, meaning they came from three germ layers in the embryo. You had your endoderm, your mesoderm, and your ectoderm. And they are coelomates or pseudocoelomates, meaning they do have cavities around their organ systems. DNA evidence is what really supports this grouping of all these organisms into this clade. So there's not one key characteristic that they all share. Some of the organisms will have a lophophore, which is a crown of cilia like you see in the bottom left hand picture. Some have a trochophore larvae.
The lofo portion of Lophotrochozoa is in reference to the lophophore, a crown of tentacles that many members of this group possess. The troche portion of Lophotrochozoa is in reference to the trochophore larvae, a hairy larvae that many members may possess. Well, if you guessed animal, you guessed correctly. The zoa portion of the name refers to the fact that these guys are, in fact, part of Animalia. We're going to look at six phylum in Lophotrochozoa. There's actually significantly more than this. There are 18 different phyla in Lophotrochozoans, but your book has narrowed it down to the six most common phylums. The first is Platyhelmus. These are your flatworms. Then we'll look at your rotifers. Ectoprocta are your moss animals, called such because they look more like moss than they do animals. Brachiopoda are your lamp shells, which I'll show you how to distinguish them, look very close to some of your mollusk. Mollusca, people tend to consider them shelled, but not all of them. Yes, your clams and mollusk are shelled, but your, some of your snails and slugs are not. Octopus is also in this group, and octopuses lack shells. Annelida are going to be your roundworms, like your earthworms. The first phylum we'll look at is Platyhelmus, the flatworms. This phylum is characterized by having thin bodies that are flattened dorsoventrally. There are four classes in this phylum. We will spend the majority of our time on three of them. The fourth class, Monogonia, we will only look at briefly. The book lumps them in with the trematodes. They are just infections on the fish. So if you're a lab student, the question is, how would you distinguish between these four classes? Well, class Turbularia are your planarians, and some of them are very, very pretty, like the flatworm you see in the upper right is a planarian. Um, others have look like they have ears. Class Monogenea, like I said, we're not going to focus on this one much, but it is parasitic. It sticks to the epidermis or gills of a fish. Cestoda are your flukes, and they are microscopic, and you could consider them our lucky organisms. They tend to have very complicated life cycles, and are lucky in the fact that they make it from one host to another in order to complete that life cycle. And Trematoda, these are going to be your tapeworms. So if you're still hungry after lunch, you may have a tapeworm. The evolutionary significance for these guys can be hard to pin down. Um, they were too soft for fossils, so we lack them in the fossil record. One key s evolutionary significance is that they do have cephalization, which is the concentration of all their sensory organs in one central location, usually referred to as the head. So like as humans, our eyes and our ears and our nose are all centralized to our head. So that is cephalization. They do have advanced sensory equipment. Many of them can sense light um, or vibrations or even chemicals dissolved in the water that they're in. They are hermaphrodites, meaning they contain both male and female reproductive parts, and some of them will even self-fertilize. Most of them do not, however. The self-fertilizing would not be considered highly advantageous because you're losing that genetic diversity you get with sexual reproduction. And one of the key things about these guys is a lot of them are highly regenerative, especially in your planarians. Um, if you cut a planarian in half, both halves will grow back the missing portion and you'll end up with two planarians instead of one. So there's a lot of research going on looking into their regenerative properties, a lot of medical research is in that area.